you haven't heard, the Cathedral Park Dock in North Portland is getting a major upgrade, and you're invited to come along for a free party on Saturday, June 29th to celebrate its grand reopening. The Human Access Project is hosting a Cathedral Park River Fest where you can dance to live funk and soul music while enjoying free swimming lessons, kayak rentals, that's pretty cool, and a life jacket giveaway. There will also be food vendors and community booths, so come on and join the party on Saturday, June 29th from 2 to 8 p.m. and experience the revitalized Cathedral Park waterfront. It's going to be awesome. I'll for sure be there, probably jumping off the dock. This month on CityCast Portland, we're interviewing candidates running to be the next mayor of our city. And today on the show, we're talking to our fifth candidate, Commissioner Mingus Maps. Since joining the Portland City Council in 2020, he's overseeing the Portland Bureau of Transportation, the Portland Water Bureau, and the Bureau of Environmental Services. We're talking to him about why he thinks he's fit for the job. Also, just a quick note that this interview took place a week or so ago, and since then, the city is still in the voting process regarding the renewal of its contract with the county's Joint Office of Homelessness. It's Thursday, June 27th. I'm Claudia Meza, and this is what Portland's talking about. What's something your kids have done growing up in Portland that you never had the chance to? You know, partly because I did grow up here, uh, one of the um, subtle pleasures of parenting is to take your kids to things that you did and cherished uh, right. um, when you were growing up. And we are today at the final day of City Fest, so the end of the Rose Festival. Um, and one of the great, amazing things that uh, we've gotten to do over the last several weeks are participate in parades and mm -hmm. uh, help uh, launch the events with the fireworks and whatnot. Certainly, I was attending those events, but they have, uh, by virtue of my current day job, they have access to some amazing rooms that I never had access to. Um, and in general, I think one of the insights my kids are getting is, um, you know, they see the life of a Local public servant uh, close up, and they are profoundly unimpressed by uh, <laughs> by my work. Um, um, but I'm glad that they, get, that they get a chance to see it. I hope that it uh, resonates with them through time, and I'm sure they will think back on these years in years to come and uh, have a deeper appreciation of what we're doing and what it meant. Yeah, I mean, it's good to know that even like rock stars' kids think that they're lame. You know? Oh, I did. I have known uh, what I, I know. Let's put it this way. I know many elected officials who have young children, and I can assure the public that none of their kids are particularly impressed with their uh, parents who were mayors and senators and uh, members of Congress and uh, members of council. Uh, um, and that, I think, uh, is one of the things that helps keep our electeds grounded and connected <laughs> to the city and the people that we serve. Yeah. Well, if you could just pick one thing. Like one thing that isn't working in Portland right now, like what would it be and how would you fix it? Oh, our house and service system. You know, uh, right now we got about 6,000 people who sleep on our sidewalks every night. You know, that's a human tragedy for the people who are out there, um, you know, sleeping in tents and uh, sleeping bags uh, in our parks and sidewalks um, and whatnot. Um, and it's also, frankly, put stresses on our entire communities. Um, you know, I live in the inner Southeast, so my kids, you know, make their own way home from school at the end of the day. It is not uncommon for them to have unfortunate interactions with folks who are on the streets and having mental health challenges. Um, I also live right across the street from a little convenience store that probably we cannot go two or three days without um, having a very unfortunate um, situation inside that store, and that store is owned by an immigrant family. You know, the, the work that they do there supports, what, two little kids, a father and a mother and a brother-in-law and um, a lady from the neighborhood. It's just your classic small Portland business. They um, are struggling to stay open mm -hmm. uh, because of the theft they face, the sort of chaos that can hate break out in there. Very frustrating given the um, frankly, hundreds of millions of dollars that our region spends trying to get people housed and connected to treatment. Um, in terms of how we turn this around, well, we need to do a lot more work around making our homeless service system 
and our mental health services work better. You know, I don't think that we're in a situation where we're under investing in these services at this point. What mm -hmm. we've done a terrible job at is actually building a continuum of services that moves people from the sidewalks into supportive housing. Uh, frankly, the steps that we need to take in order to get from here to there are to clarify the relationship between what the city does in this space and what the county does in this space. You know, um, over here on the city side, uh, we primarily are in the business of doing sticks and bricks kind of things. Like I'm the commissioner in charge of roads, uh, the Water Bureau, and the Bureau of Environmental Services. And that's true breaks basically for all of my colleagues on council. We kind of do what it says on the names of our bureaus. On the other hand, the county is in charge of mental health services, fundamentally in charge of houselessness services. But even though we have two different roles in this space and we interact all day, every day, um, the nature of that interaction is often underdefined, is often undercoordinated, and frankly, does not serve the folks uh, um, who are sleeping on our streets or trying to operate a business or grow a family mm -hmm. particularly well. So um, I'm deeply committed as a member of council and um, as mayor of Portland to make that relationship between the city and county work better. My goal is every time a city employee interacts with someone who's on the streets and needs help, uh, we have a partner at the county that we can call and connect that person to mental health services, drug and alcohol services, supportive housing services. Yeah. Uh, we've made some progress in that space, but we're not there yet. And you're saying the way that you as a mayor would fix it is by connecting or basically clarifying the roles between the city and the county and maybe getting the city and the county to work a little bit better? Yeah. Uh, so how would you go about that? So here, let me give you a great example. So um, especially during the pandemic, the city set up safe rest villages and our task sites, which are basically larger safe rest villages. Those have been remarkably effective in actually providing uh, folks who are sleeping on our streets with a place to go. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that we've actually uh, discovered and are delighted to know now is actually when you move someone from the sidewalk and get them into one of these uh, safe rest villages, actually they get better, you know, in the space about three or four months and they're kind of ready to move on to a supportive housing service space. So, you know, actually ready to move inside. Now, one of the challenges that we face right now uh, with the county, um, with our task sites, which are our larger safe rest villages, is we have people who are actually kind of literally ready to move into housing. They've kind of stabilized and whatnot, but we can't get housing vouchers out of the county in order to actually move them into apartments, which is incredibly disappointing for a number of reasons. Number one, we have people who are ready for the services. Number two, if we can't move people out of our safe rest villages into that more supportive housing situation, then uh, the capacity of our safe rest villages freezes. You know, if we can move basically four cohorts of folks through our safe rest villages in a year, um, we're then going to make a huge difference in actually getting people off the street permanently. On the mm -hmm. other hand, if we reach capacity at our safe rest villages and we're not able to move them on um, and to supportive housing, which is very much a county's responsibility, then the whole system freezes up. And right now we are fundamentally frozen up. That's a great example, but I'm, I'm asking like how you as the mayor would make it so the city and the county did work better. And in that example, like we have, uh, we have a joint office of homeless services where the city and the county come together and basically agree on how much we're going to throw into this household services space. And we should agree on what specific services that we provide and frankly, what our goals are. Uh, right now, mm -hmm. we have a contract that vaguely defines that relationship, but up until, or it is yet to define what outcomes we're pushing towards work. We have yet to define what services the city provides and what services the county provides. Um, frankly, all that we're really doing is uh, shuffling money back and forth without a focus goal in terms of what outcomes we expect or even what services we specifically uh, um, agree to provide our clients. Now, frankly, one of the things that we're working awfully hard on, and this indeed was the meeting I was in right before um, I came on to, uh, to chat with you, is to, to clearly define in the joint office contract what the city provides, what the county provides, how much dollars go there, you know, what our metrics uh, for um, success look like, and frankly, what do we do when um, in the unfortunate situation where we're not meeting our roles? Okay. Well, I didn't quite hear what you would do as mayor, but do you intend to well, vote the, for the joint see. office? Let me, 
right, let me let's dive into this because this is very important. Um, and frankly, this is how we can get out of this. So the city and the county have a contract that defines the role that each of us should play in the houseless service systems. One of the things I will do as mayor is demand clarity around what that contract uh, looks like. So we're talking about how many dollars the city puts in, uh, the specific services that the county will provide in exchange right. for that, and the outcomes we expect of what we do when those outcomes are not reached. Um, and frankly, there are two people at the table who will ultimately shape that contract. It is the mayor of Portland and it is the chair of Multnomah County. And what I am sharing with you today are the values and goals that I bring into those negotiations with the county. And if we can't agree on that, then I think we're going to have to fundamentally reimagine the joint office because it's no longer a joint office and it's we're going to have to move in a different direction. My goal is to bring clarity to the work that we've done under the umbrella of the joint office. If we can't um, come up with a satisfactory agreement, which meaningfully means boost people off the sidewalks, then uh, we'd move to our plan B, which is to frankly have the city develop its strategies for housing folks independent of the uh, joint office, which frankly is not a sustainable position. Ultimately, we need to get there. Um, one of the things I bring in this race is clarity uh, to that conversation. Real quick. So that, yeah. that contract is happening this year. It's not going to wait for you to become mayor, correct? Like that is something that is in vote right now and needs to pass before next year because it's going to um, it's going to dictate, like you stated, how the joint office will move forward. So my question, do you intend to vote for the joint office contract this year? Well, I will tell you, I met with the mayor's team uh, earlier this morning. Uh, we have a very new iteration of the joint co uh, joint office contract, uh, which frankly looks very different from the uh, um, agreement that uh, we had even two or three weeks ago. I have not had a chance to um, fully read the new contract. That's one of my that's my homework uh, for uh, this week. Um, I will also say one of the things that we're likely to see in um, the contract moving forward is uh, a series of bitch marks that need to be achieved over time. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but our time is tight and we do have a lot to get to. So, like, yeah. if, you, if you're cool with this, we're just going to move on to the next question. Of course. You know, last year, you and I also talked about Vision Zero, the city's yep. goal to eliminate all traffic uh, crash fatalities and serious injuries on Portland streets uh, by 2025, right? And earlier this year, Portland City Council adopted the first update to the Vision Zero action plan since 2019. Yep. So a lot, you know has changed since 2019, just got the updates. What's actually changing? Sure, well, number one, uh, we I, we need to be transparent here, um, especially since the pandemic, uh, traffic fatalities in Portland have been heading in the wrong direction. I'll point out this, that this is not unique to Portland. Um, this is happening nationwide, and I think it's part of a broad cultural shift in both traffic enforcement and how people drive. In the Portland space, one of the th things that we're continuing to do in order to drive these traffic fatalities down is to, you know, make new investments in our transportation infrastructure, you know, uh, speed kills. So anything that we can do to uh, reduce speeds in our high crash corridors is going to make a difference in terms of saving lives. Um, over the course of the next year, I'm going to double the number of traffic cameras that we have on the streets. That provides another incentive. You know, frankly, one of the puzzles and it, uh, um, that happens in, the, in this space is that we see that traffic fatalities are increasing dramatically. But it's also not the case that our infrastructure is getting that much worse. Indeed, you know, we're improving our, our transportation infrastructure, but traffic fatalities are increasing. So what's changing here? And frankly, one of the things that's changed in this, in this space is enforcement. Um, we have, in the last several years, we have dramatically reduced the amount of number of cops that are out there enforcing the speed limit. I think that has um, interacted with the change in how people drive. And the result are, you know, more people dying on our streets. So one of the things that I, I'm an advocate for and been successful at achieving in my time on council is convincing my colleagues to um, invest and grow our traffic enforcement. We're making good, progress in this space. Indeed, I think that if you take a look at the fatality numbers, we're heading in the right direction. But let me assure you, we are not in a position right now to achieve our true goal, which is to eliminate traffic fatalities um, in the next couple of years. That's going to take a lot of work, um, but hey, there are a couple of ways to do it. You can do it through better infrastructure. You can do it through enforcement, and you've got to do it through cultural change. Yeah. And uh, as a commissioner in charge of PBOT, I've worked 
hard to uh, make progress in each of those spaces. And as your next mayor, that is, those will be my goals too. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the, the numbers because they're not getting better. According to Bike Portland, there are 23 deaths this year as of June 4th, which is similar to the 27 deaths by the same date in 2023. So things seem to be about the same as last year, not getting better. And last year we saw a record number of traffic deaths. But at yep. the recent council meeting, you did state, uh, and this is a quote, where we have invested, we have had success. Can you explain what's working in actually saving lives, being that the numbers aren't saying that we are actually saving lives? Sure. Well, number one, I would actually, the numbers that you cite do show a, a real reduction. I think every life matters. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't dismiss that. And one of the things that we see is most of our fatalities happen in spaces where on a handful of roads, basically, are high crash corridors. These are places where people are driving. Um, they're typically, these are roads that ha carry a lot of traffic and have um, high speeds. So when we go into a space like that and provide better lighting, provide crosswalks, uh, reduce the speed limit, add speed cameras, do more enforcement, one of the things that we consistently see is that uh, traffic fatalities do go down. You can take a look at the work that we've done out on division um, and pretty much all of our high traffic corridors where you make an intervention, uh, you do tend to see progress. Now, um, are we doing enough work in this space in order to bring us down to zero? Well, the, the answer there is uh, clearly no. We got probably two dozen high traffic uh, fatality corridors in our city. Uh, you also have a bureau that is primarily funded through a local gas tax and parking meter revenues, gas taxes and parking meter revenues are both on decline. So one of our challenges is, you know, we don't have enough dollars to bring into this space. But one of the things that we do know is that the interventions that we do have work, you know, speed kills. If you get hit uh, by a car and go on your bike going 10 miles an hour, you are likely to survive that one. If you get a hit by a car that's going 40 miles an hour, you are not going to survive that. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's take a quick break here. And when we come back, more with mayoral candidate and city commissioner, Mingus Maps. Hi, I'm David Plotz, CEO of CityCast. Or, as I can say now, thanks to a few weeks with Babbel, Hola, soy David Plotz, el jefe the CityCast. What if in 2024, you've got a little bit better every day? When you're learning a new language with Babbel, that's exactly what you're doing. And if Babbel can help me start speaking a new language in just three weeks, imagine what you could do in a full year. I got started with Babbel because I realized that my girlfriend, who's a native Spanish speaker, and my son, who's an AP Spanish, were conspiring against me, or I thought they were conspiring against me in Spanish. I wanted to know what they were talking about. And now, thanks to literally just a few weeks of Babbel, I'm starting to be able to eavesdrop. It is rare that something so fun and simple, and Babbel is super fun and very simple, is also so useful. So here's a special limited time deal for CityCast listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for CityCast listeners at babbel.com slash citycast. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash citycast. Spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash citycast. Rules and restrictions may apply. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. I'm also curious what you think your accomplishments have been as a commissioner, you know, that you have taken stances on major issues, but sometimes have backed away from them or, you know, those Where issues. Where have I backed away? Uh, revising the charter reform process in 2022. Um, I don't think that's correct. I wonder if that Oh, I it is. You opposed Commissioner Rubio's vision to reform the city's permitting system, but then you ultimately voted in favor of it. You also voted against extending the Joint Office of Homeless Service contract last year, but were outvoted on the council. But I'm asking you, like, what do you think your key successes are as your time as commissioner? Oh, my gosh. Um, 
Well, thank you for the question. Um, I've served during a remarkable time. If you think back to where we were um, when I first came into office three and a half years ago, um, homicides were at record levels. One of the things I demanded and said a challenge to our city office, let's bring down homicides by about I think 15% a year. Uh, frankly, it took us a little bit of time to actually bend that curve, but we've actually have done that. Um, and we, um, yeah, we still got a long ways to go. The Portland that we see today does not look like the Portland of 2015, where we might have seen 16 homicides or something. But we are certainly in a place where um, violent crimes are down dramatically, property crimes are down dramatically. Um, I'm incredibly proud of the work that we've done in um, in my bureaus. I'm the commissioner in charge of the Water Bureau, Environmental Services, and PBOT. Like what, you know, like what what is it that you're proud about? Because I'm sure there is like reasons, of course, oh, sure. you've, <laughs> you've been doing. Um, uh, yeah. So t- just give me an example. Let's, of- let's talk about, I'll tell you, uh, take a look at our, um, if you've lived in Portland for a long time, go back uh, when I was a kid in Portland, uh, you couldn't swim in the Willamette River. It wasn't a good idea because of all the pollution that was in there. I'll tell you, as the commissioner in charge of environmental services, I have worked uh, relentlessly to build the infrastructure and enforce the laws that keep pollution from our river. I will tell you, you might have a couple of heavy rainy days where uh, we might have some overflows, but probably 360 days a year, you can swim in the Willamette River. I'm the commissioner in charge of the Water Bureau. We have some of the best water in the nation. You know, on most days we serve about a million people, uh, water, clean water uh, every day of the year. Some of the best water that you can find in North America. And we are building the infrastructure to make sure that that system remains robust for generations to come. Um, The river was swimmable before you you came in. I mean, a lot of that came because of the big pipe completion in 2011, making it so it's no longer, you know, sewer water isn't running into it. So I'm glad that you're upkeeping, but I'm just saying taking credit for a 2011 project. Well, I mean, the the work that we do, if you've all the infrastructure, well, not yet. In fact, all the infrastructure that we build in, in environmental services is designed to keep uh, water and our uh, wastewater and mm-hmm. other pollutants um, out of our rivers. And they've been doing a great job, for sure. Oh, well, yeah. they, I, and, uh, I agree. Our environmental services folks mm-hmm. um, are, are true environmental heroes, incredibly proud of the work they've done. Um, I also believe that we've made incredible progress in terms of moving the conversation uh, forward and in a positive direction around houselessness. I think if you go back from 2016 to the present day, I think houselessness has uh, exploded. I think we finally have a path and a plan that can actually begin to get people off the streets. Um, Well, let's talk about clarity, because you said, you know, you as a mayor, as a candidate, you want to bring clarity. And I mean, I got to say, I feel like that's something Portlanders have firmly expressed wanting is transparency from city government and clarity and honesty from its city leaders. Yeah. Um, but I want to ask about some of the communication that you've been quoted. Now, there was a recent back and forth on a proposed bike lane on Southwest 4th Avenue. It was reported that you were pushing for the project despite protests from the Portland Metro Chamber. However, Willamette Week reported that the Chamber CEO, Andrew Hone, he said you promised to make major cutbacks to the Southwest 4th Avenue project, but then you changed your stance publicly. So he said, like, no, no, that's not what he told me. So what actually happened? Is Hone misremembering? Yes. I mean, I've been clear and transparent, and I have not changed my position on this. I I can't control what other people say. It is true. The business community downtown is deeply concerned about some of the improvements that we're going to make on Southwest 4th. Um, I have been interactive and collaborative with uh, stakeholders in this space. You know, we'll be paving Southwest 4th. We'll be taking uh, better curb cuts. Uh, we'll be adding, adding some bike infrastructure. But I think uh, some folks are particularly concerned about the impact that the bike infrastructure will have in this space, uh, mostly because they, they can point to projects around the city that they go, this was not, did not work well for us. I've done uh, um, a lot of education about uh, why um, the plans that we have in place for Southwest have worked effectively. I think if you look at the record, my words on this have not changed. And I also cannot impact or change what other folks say in this space. So uh, okay. we might actually talk to our, our good friends over at the Portland Chamber of Commerce to get their perspective on this, but I have not wavered on this one bit. But this also seems like a small deal. 
like, but it's important as well. So if we're talking about clarity, uh, Bike Portland reported confusion about your stance on whether, and it's so like small, but the revenue of the local gas tax, like what, like what that money was uh, going to go to. And at the time you were drumming up support, it's already been successfully voted in. And there was some confusion if it was going to be spent on bike infrastructure. So during your speech to labor union members who you were trying to get endorsement from for that tax, you stated, and this is a quote, I emphasize these are not funds that are being used to build bike lanes that drive everybody crazy. And you ensured it would focus on bread and butter, basic street maintenance. Uh, But six days prior, you told a member of the Metro Climate Action Team that the tax would go to, and here's another quote from you, maintaining and improving our bike infrastructure that helps keep people safe. And I'm sure bike infrastructure maintenance may not be the same as, say, creating new bike lanes from scratch, but you colored your stance for who you thought you were speaking to and what they wanted to hear in a way that doesn't really lend itself to clarity. I mean, even within that same conversation that you had with the union members, one of them was like, well, I ride my bike to work every day and I kind of do want bike lanes. And you're like, don't worry, this money is going to all, you know, modes of transportation, including bike infrastructure. But again, you know, people were visibly confused, like what you meant. And that's not clear. Sure. Well, um, let me, well, let me try to be clear now, Claudia. I love Uh, that. Thank you. Uh, Fixing Your Streets uh, is a program that we use to uh, raise dollars to do basically about a third of the road infrastructure payments that I do. So this is potholes, filling potholes, paving roads, you know, fixing broken street lights and other basic infrastructure. So what we're doing, our basic projects here, I think in the initial uh, comment that you shared with me, and then indeed, I think this is probably where some of the confusion came from is taking context uh, words that I say out of context. On the one hand, I think I talked about uh, bike projects that drive people crazy, and I think you can easily find Portlanders where we go in. PBOT is a transformational bureau. We often go in and fundamentally reimagine how a space works. Frankly, those dollars are not the dollars that we use fixing our streets from. If we're going to do a major project which fundamentally reimagines the space, we're probably getting an outside grant in order to do that. Uh, fixing our streets is what we use for basic stuff. Um, you're not going to see Fixing Your Streets projects go through and f- build a bridge that doesn't allow cars on it, for example. But you will see Fixing Your Streets dollars go into, will we go and pave a road? Will we, uh, could we use some Fixing Your Streets dollars to add a bike lane? For sure. That's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Um, the main thing I was trying to communicate when we we're having that discussion about having how to fund our roads um, for the next four or five years is... You know, the fixing your streets dollars are incredibly important because of the basic dollars that we use for basic maintenance and infrastructure work. These are not the dollars that are kind of transformative, game-changing, moonshot projects. But it also seems like these kind of like unclear or misunderstandings occurred within your own bureaus where they're like, well, I thought this was happening, but I guess this is happening. And I mean, I, I don't want to go all the way into it, but, but I it am would talking help because to- I have no idea what you're talking about in, the, in this space. I meet with my bureau directors all the time. Oh, sure. So, sure. Uh, where were my bureau directors confused? Well, I am speaking specifically about Millicent Williams yeah, uh, during okay. the Broadway bike lane it was a little bit of a scandal within the biking community because she stated that they were going to go forward with blocking this lane and it contradicted a statement from the Bureau and from you. She was saying, this is what we were going to do. This is what we were told to do. And then you're just like, I never said that. But then there was emails that contradicted that. So that's what I'm saying. There's a confusion. You're shaking your head, but I mean, it is reported And that was really confusing. And even if you're like, well, that's not what I said. What I'm saying is it doesn't matter what's right, what's right. It's the confusion. It's the the non-clarity of like people aren't clear about where you stand, where you want things to go, including your bureau. I mean, that's not clarity. Well, Claudia, I I think what you might be pointing to um, is uh, maybe the quality of reporting that happens in this space. Okay, Uh, Okay. I have worked... I've worked very closely with my with my bureau directors certainly every week, and certainly my team is in there in uh, conversation with them uh, consistently. I gave uh, my uh, PBOT director the instruction to move forward, talk to the stakeholders on Southwest Broadway to see where we could make improvements to make that road work better. So we made some changes along there, which I think, for the most part, it worked out great. Um, so. 
I, and I think the reporting on this, frankly, I did not recognize the reporting on this did not jive up with my experience. And it's since I'm the guy who actually is giving the directions and doing the work, I would I would expect and think that like my experience in this should matter. You know, I I can't. I have no influence over what blogs pu- publish. Well, how would you avoid these kind of miscommunications as mayor of Portland? Like, what what, what do you think is a good? I will route? be transparent and uh, truthful, and I you know I will tell you when things. Uh, I'll tell you uh, things. I'll tell you the good news. And I'll tell you the bad news. I think one of the things that you do not see with like me or my administration is actually the kind of flip flopping that you seem to suggest that I'm doing. Uh, that is actually just not part of our brand. Well, thank you so much for. Uh, going through some of these questions with me. We really appreciate your time. Uh, last question. When you leave town, I'm curious, like what you miss the most when you're on work trips or vacations? Like, is there anything that you're just like, I, you know, when I get back to Portland, this is what I'm doing? Well, um, I work every day, so I don't actually get to leave town very often. Um, certainly uh, when I'm away, I miss the city. I miss our culture. I miss our uh, local businesses. I miss our friends. You know, one of the reasons why I am raising my family in Portland is I believe that Portland is truly one of the uh, most compelling cities in North America. You know, we live in a beautiful geographic area. The folks who live in this town tend to be kind, creative, and um, deeply caring. I'm excited about our city. Um, I think we have a vision for the future, uh, which is compelling and could be a model for the world. So, uh, it's one of the reasons why, frankly, I don't leave and I don't take vacations because I'm, uh, I think we have so deeply compelling work to get done in this space. All right, me. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for hanging out with me. Thank you. I appreciate it. And now for some events happening this week. Every Thursday on the show, we like to bring you a few recommendations to help you plan your weekend. Here's what we got. Cathedral Park River Fest is happening this Saturday from 2 to 8 p.m. at Cathedral Park in St. John's. It's the grand opening of the newly installed swimming dock. Even if you're not up for swimming in the Willamette, there will be free boat rentals, music, and food. It should be a super fun time. Also, just a reminder that every Friday night until August 23rd, zoo nights are happening at the Oregon Zoo from 5.30 p.m. to close. There are more food and drink options, live music, and just generally a more chill vibe than an average day at the zoo. I really love those nights. It's a big reason I became a member. And if you're a fan of comedy, in addition to the free Friday evening stand-up at Laurelhurst Park, Maria Bamford is in town starting tonight through Sunday, and there seem to be tickets still available for her late shows all three nights at Helium. If you're a big fan of Bamford's, this is a great opportunity to see her perform in a more intimate setting. For even more local events and news, sign up for our daily newsletter, Hey Portland. We'll throw all links in the show notes. That's all for today here on CityCast Portland. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please share it with a friend, rate, or leave us a review. It really does help us out. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more from around the city. Until then, see you at Slim's.